Future trading involves risk and is not suitable for all investors. Content provided in this segment is meant for educational purposes and is not a solicitation to buy or sell commodities. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Grain Feed, brought to you by EverAg. This is your weekly news feed for all things grain and all things feed. Each week, we bring you updates on the markets with unique perspectives for an amazing team of analysts with the intention of helping dairy and livestock producers manage their risk. I'm your host, Jim Matthews, reporting from the Chicago office as we record the first episode of 2023. We hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas and holiday season and a happy new year celebration. And of course, lots of cows across the U.S., Hope you stayed warm during that very chilly stretch we had there at the Christmas holiday. Hopefully we're back into more comfortable milking conditions to kick off the year. Joining me today, my partner in crime on our Feed Foundations team, Director of Feed Procurement, Mr. Jake Kingsley. Jake, how are we today? Doing wonderful, Jim. Happy New Year. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good, Jake. It's it's just you and me today. I did ask a couple of our grain marketing advisors uh, to step in and help us out. Um, Everyone seems to be on the road, hard at work, hustling, visiting farms, producer meetings. So all good reasons. But for those that turned us down, they're on the, uh, I think they're probably on the naughty list. And uh, a year from now, we'll be coal in the stockings for those guys. Mm -hmm. Coal Mm -hmm. for coal. Just throwing that hint, hint as to maybe who's in trouble. Um, so why don't you and I kick things off? We got a lot to work through today. We'll take a quick look at the markets this week. We started the new year under pressure. March corn had rallied its way back to 685 after Christmas, what we like to call that the old Santa Claus rally. It certainly seemed to be the start of the seasonal trend for corn on its way up through the winter. But since then, as we kicked off 2023 this week, the market is somewhat liquidated and quite rapidly here over just a couple trading sessions. We're back down to 650 on March corn, 650, dragged lower by that lacking demand, weakening crude oil and other energy prices to start off the year. March beans made a similar move. They had pushed up through 15 bucks a bushel. A lot of that coming from you know Argentine dryness forecasts. We got up to 1530 last week before falling back down towards below 1480s, so a big swing for beans as well. March meal, though, remains stubbornly elevated. We have pulled off a decent amount from the highs, but it's still extremely firm, and we were still trading in that 450 to 460 plus range as we started today's session. So, Jake, we're in a very interesting time of the year for grain and feed markets. The U.S. export window quickly begins to close. Once we enter January, and of course, then we turn our eyes towards South America during their key development and then ultimate harvest season and other various items here and there in the U.S. and abroad that we need to keep at least on the back burners, knowing that they're there. But Jake, since it's just you and me, let's borrow from our dear friends, Kathleen and Phil and what they do on the Dairy Download podcast. We'll give our viewers some key items to watch for 2023, but specifically here for the first quarter of the calendar year, Jan, Feb, March. So Jake, three key items. What's the first item that you have on your list? Well, I think you alluded to it a little bit already, Jim, South American production and what's going on down there. As you said, they're coming up on their uh, key phase of their growing season and they'll quickly be into their harvest period there. So uh, all eyes are on that. Um, you had mentioned some dryness in Argentina. They caught a little splash of rain there to kind of alleviate that just a bit, but they are still drier than we'd like to be. Um, so I think that's making some headlines, maybe garnering a little bit more airtime than maybe is due, especially when you look at the weather and growing conditions to the north there in Brazil, where it's near ideal for the crop down there right now. Um, And those guys have record acres in the ground. They're expected to have record production. Uh, We've been watching this for quite a while here. Most analysts still have them coming in with 150 plus million metric tons of soybeans from Brazil alone. That's more than triple what's expected to come out of Argentina. And it's a full 10% increase over their 
previous record if realized. Um, and so a little back of the napkin math would show that, you know, Argentina being dry um, and they could still catch some rains that the crop would benefit from there too. So that's not quite buttoned up in a disaster by any means. But if they come in and lose 5% of the yield they had been anticipating, um, this extra production in Brazil is more than enough to offset it. You know, you're looking at, say they lose 5% production in Argentina. That's so uh, two and a half million metric tons or maybe 90-ish million bushels. Brazil coming in at 150 million metric tons would be a few million metric tons off of what the industry is looking for today. And that would still be about a 10 million metric ton or 360 million bushels more than their largest crop ever. So you're still talking about um, producing to the tune of 250 million bushels more than they ever have in South America. That's right around where our current ending stocks in the U.S. are. So if they were to come in average and maintain the balance sheet, global balance sheet, that would be the first thing we were looking for going into this growing season. Now they're potentially going to be able to produce an average crop plus what we have left over here in the U.S. I think that makes a pretty good little addition to the global balance sheet and really helps things out. Um, so there's some potential there uh, to really change this market up or at least set us up to kind of put the icing on the cake when we go to planting here in the U.S. Um, kind of maybe start to break this cycle we've been in for the last two and a half or three years now. Yeah, I think that the globe is definitely has been anticipating the, the like back to back bumper crops from the two hemispheres. And as you've noted, Jake, we have not had it for a year or so. They had a lot of dryness problems last year. They also had dryness problems the year before, but uh, the most recent growing season for them versus the ideal conditions you noted, specifically Brazil, it will be a huge jump year on year on their soybean production. As you said, if realized, and that's why this is kind of item number one on the list, is because they are developing those crops now. Uh, so, you know, the South Americans are kind of dealing with what we deal with every July, August. It's every day we come in, check the headlines. Are, are we entering a drought? Are ridges coming over the Rockies to dry us out in the Midwest? Right. Those are the headlines kind of driving those markets here every summer. And that's what they are experiencing now. It'll be really interesting to see what the U.S. government does on its WASDI report next week if they start trimming uh, Argentine production numbers based on those dryness concerns. But like you said, Jake, I think the debate going forward is can Brazil's ideal conditions more than offset uh, some of the losses that we are anticipating to see in Argentina? And we still got some time. If they get some decent rains here over the next you know, two to four weeks, maybe more, we got a chance to you know, get some better soil moisture conditions, maybe stabilize some of those declining conditions they're experiencing in some of those areas. So uh, excellent item number one. What about item number two on your list, Jake? Well, I think item number two, just by way of chronological order here, would be the uh, EPA draft proposal for uh, renewable fuels, particularly looking at the renewable diesel initiative and how that affects soy oil and other veg oils and the soy crush. So we had the draft letter come out late 2022. Um, it's supposed to be finalized here in the first quarter. We'll have public hearings coming up pretty quick and opportunity for public comment due in early February. Some of the things that were most concerning for the soy oil market when that draft came out were that there were some different qualifying factors for the credits, the carbon credits that stem from that, um, depending on where that energy was sent, your credits were of different values. Some of the blending targets had changed. It was expected that this would largely benefit soy oil specifically, but then they came in and said that there would be some higher blend inclusion of some other veg oils like canola oil and some, some other veg oils. Cottonseed oil could potentially work its way in there, things like that. Um, and so we'll see if any of those change with the 
a revised version here in the next month or two. And if that kind of shifts this thing back, uh, when that first draft came out, that's really when the soy oil and soybean meal markets kind of shifted. And we saw that big rally in soybean meal and soy oil really started to fall off. Um, the funds kind of swapped their positions there and got a little longer meal and took some of their long out of oil. At the end of the day, I think crush margins are still healthy. This is not like ethanol where they're just grinding along right at break even and and doing it because they've, they've got the infrastructure there. Crush margins are still very healthy. They've certainly lost a little bit of steam since that change there, uh, but they're positive. And so I think maybe at most we see a slowdown in additional uh, crush capacity coming online, but the stuff that's already slated and expected to come on over the next couple of years, I think that stuff's pretty well unchanged. It'll probably still come right along. Big oil is still involved and invested in this thing. There are individual states that are already building legislation and, and initiatives around this to continue to drive it forward. And so I think we'll see some changes from what was in that first draft. Maybe we don't get back to the original expectations that some folks had in this marketplace, but uh, I imagine we'll come back to somewhat of a middle ground and this thing will continue to drive forward. Good deal, Jake. And this is this is kind of an interesting interesting item to have on our on our top three, right? Because this is kind of a annual check the box. EPA will, you know, release maybe what the next few years forecast for blending requirements might be. And usually it's you know, the same old drill continue to ramp up blending requirements for ethanol, for biomass, biofuel, uh, all that good stuff. But this year was kind of the, I don't know, they threw a wrench in the gears here, uh, which should be a quiet uh, release. Like you said, shook up the markets pretty dramatically. It definitely kicked off this uh, very dramatic meal rally uh, that was very unexpected and certainly was not based for us anyway off of the fundamentals. You just touched on how large of a crop uh, the South Americans are going to produce for soybeans. So should be adding pressure onto the soy complex uh, going forward here. But yeah, this this kind of threw a wrench into that. And as you said, the variables over where the credits can be derived from and how that energy is distributed, specifically getting into like the charging of electric vehicles. There are a lot of new things that we usually don't see in that report. But it definitely spiced things up in the marketplace. And you touched on the funds piling back into meal against their position they had in bean oil. And we've seen the futures markets move based on those aggressive movements from that managed money position. I believe our colleague Britt O'Connell had also discussed this on the From the Furrow podcast, which was released this morning, Thursday. So if you have a chance, check out that podcast as Britt discusses that with her special guest. So stay tuned there. Um, Jake, how about item three? We've touched on South American production and their weather being key for us. We've touched on the renewable fuel standards from the EPA. What do you have for item three heading into 2023? So number three just really rounds out the first quarter here. Something we always look at, U.S. planting intentions. Um, I mean, we're in the first week of 2023 here, but ultimately we're 90 days away from that planting intentions report that the USDA puts out every year. And maybe some of the first acres there in the Midwest or in the southern parts of, of the planting region going into the ground. And so we've got a bumper crop coming in Brazil. Can we stack up another one behind that here in the U.S. to really start to change this market? What has this renewable fuel initiative done to change the acreage landscape? So really they came in and created something of some some significant new demand for soybeans here domestically. And that calls for a lot more acres of soybeans going into the ground But to do that, you have to meaningfully affect corn acres here as well. So how do we find balance there going forward in the next 90 to 120 days getting into the planting season here? So that'll be something to watch. Prices are are good on the exchange there to where these guys should still be profitable. Of course, their inputs are much higher than they were last year and the year before that. But prices are still strong enough that we're going to see plenty of acres go in the ground. I would imagine we'll see one crop, if not both, try to go for 
record production here in the U.S. Of course, a lot of that hangs on the weather and how that pans out over the growing season. But we're in for a very interesting, uh, what is that, March 30th or 31st that that report will come out. I think we'll be in for a very interesting little setup to start off the growing season there. And the U.S. farmer is very good at growing grain and, and soybeans here. And we'll see if we can't back up what Brazil's doing get a back-to-back bumper crop here and, and change this thing up for the feed buyer finally. You know, the grain producers had a couple of really good years financially um, if they managed things well and feed buyers and users have had to struggle to really stay profitable. Maybe this is the chance for that thing to kind of start to turn in our favor a little bit here. So we will see. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see, Jake. And as you noted, that report comes out every year at the last trading day of March. It's planning intentions for the U.S. farmer as of the first couple weeks of March and last couple weeks of February. The government surveys uh, the U.S. farmer for their intentions. I think the way things stand at the moment, you know, the if you would have taken a snapshot the couple days after Christmas when we had these corn trading you know, 15 to 20 cents above six bucks might've been a different story than today because now we have these corn trading back towards 590. So based on maybe cost of production, what a difference a couple of week makes, suddenly 580, 590 corn might not be as attractive as what is still close to $14 November beans. So a lot of time between now and that report, but it'll sneak up on us. It's already first week of January. Um, and a lot of U.S. farmers that our grain marketing advisors are working with are currently making those decisions based on what fuel is doing, fertilizers doing, uh, the cost of borrowing money, et cetera. So it'll be very interesting to see how the next couple months play out here in the U.S. So those are the top three things, Jake. Um, how about a couple just, I don't know, wild cards or variables that they're on the back burners, but they can just sneak up on any given day and change the way the market moves. Sure. And I think these are a couple of things that are are not unfamiliar to everybody that's been watching this market and so may not be shocking to be here. I think the, the first three that we talked about have some deadlines to them and will have some empirical data to digest in, in a fairly short amount of time. So that's why we keep our eyes on those. But then we got a couple of wild cards, like you said. So Chinese demand, of course, and then whatever happens in the Black Sea over the next few months and how that pans out with Ukraine and Russia. Um, and I think these are wild cards just because there's so much happening with China. Their economy's changing. They're moving out of COVID restrictions at the moment and coming into some waves of higher infection rates. How do they respond to that? How does that economy respond to that over time here? They've been very slow on purchases out of the U.S., especially as far as corn is concerned. Um, And we had mentioned earlier that export window starts to close pretty quickly here over the next four to six weeks. So do we miss out on sales and they turn to Brazil, which would be new for the first time in several years, what, seven or eight years since they bought corn from Brazil? So do they continue to do that and really go cold turkey on our market? That could change things fundamentally here for us both on futures and basis. And then how does the Black Sea pan out? Of course, that's a day-to-day situation. It seems like it's it's kind of quieted down, at least on the news front for us here. But there's still very much a conflict over there that could change the landscape at any moment. Um, So will they renew their trade deal in March to allow that grain corridor to continue to flow? How are logistics going to look moving forward? There's damage to the infrastructure. There's always the concern of ships being able to make it in and out of those ports safely. Quality of the grain. There's some stuff that I'm sure is going to be coming out of storage that had been tucked away for quite a while and maybe not been able to be managed as well as it normally would have. So do we see quality effect overall availability there? And of course, the the big question is, how long does this thing last? Does it get worse before it gets better? Have we seen the worst of it? Nobody really knows the answers to that one. And so that's, I mean, again, these are wild cards, but they're things that we have to keep an eye on. They're the reason for increased volatility in these markets and uncertainty. And they, they are 
probably the greatest drivers for need to truly manage risk because you just don't know what tomorrow is going to bring from those guys. And, and we've seen it over the last coming up on a year now of day-to-day decisions by one or two individuals moving these markets limit one, two, three days in a row. So something to keep an eye on here. That's exactly right, Jake. Yeah, the Chinese situation, uh, maybe the pendulum swung from one end completely to the other in terms of keeping folks locked down entirely for a thousand days, uh, I think were some of the stats you're seeing this week to then just letting everybody out and everybody gets sick and uh, they're supposed to be celebrating the Lunar New Year here in the next couple of weeks. So who knows what the Chinese economy is going to look like uh, over the next few months. And if they do indeed step in to ever pick up U.S. corn uh, or even ramp up the existing pace of U.S. beans. So big variable there. And the Black Sea, I think as we're actually recording on Thursday morning, there's talk of uh, Russia asking for a 36 hour ceasefire. So more details to come on that. And perhaps we'll see more of that after this recording uh, is released. So as we're recording right now, Thursday morning, those are the uh, headlines at the moment. So hoping to find out a little bit more about that. But proves your point, Jake, that any given moment, a headline can pop up from that region and potentially change the way markets are moving. So I think we're running a bit over on time. But before I let you go, Jake, continuing to borrow from Kathleen and Phil, Next week, USDA monthly WASDE report, bold prediction. Ooh, okay. I think we're going to see a significant increase potentially in corn yield. What were we at to finish the year? 171.9 or something in December? What was it? Look at you. I, I'm calling for an end of day 173 to 173 and a half. I think there's going to be a little more corn out there than I thought. And I think they're definitely going to start to affect exports. We've talked about China being on the sidelines. I think maybe we start to see that surface in these reports. Look at you, Jake. That is bold. That's bold. You know what I'm going to do, Jake? I'm going to cut Argentine corn production by 3 million tons next week. 3 million tons okay. on the January report. We will see. We'll see what happens. I like you went the U.S. route. I went the Argentine route. I like that. Very bold. And a reminder to everyone, please listen to the Dairy Download. And please listen to From the Furrow, both extremely informative and excellent podcast for you guys out there. I think that'll wrap things up for today. Excellent work, Jake. Great to be with you to kick off 2023. Thanks for being a good colleague and co-anchor here on the show. We, of course, would like to thank the Everag Insights crew for their support. Thank you to Paige for her production magic. And thank you to the viewers. For watching the grain feed, contact information is on the screen. We greatly appreciate your feedback. That's all for today. We'll see you next time on the grain feed.